The idea of forgiveness coming from Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. When you look at the screen, you see there the idea from the Psalm, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our iniquities. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. With this idea in mind, we think about those today who have problems with sin. Now, we're not talking about particularly just the idea of repentance, more the idea of focusing on overcoming the things we have done wrong. You notice here in Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12, it says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We think about that idea, it is a comforting thought to know that when we have committed a sin against God, transgressed his word, and ask God to forgive us as we repent of those sins, whatever it may be, to find that we know that God has indeed removed those things from us. God's forgiveness still draws me questions today. Some ask, how many times will God forgive us? Or how many times can God forgive me? You know, we think about that, we know, of course, when he tells, when Christ is speaking in the Bible, it tells us, you know, how many times should, should a brother forgive another? So many times, seven, well, he's not talking literally, he's talking the idea that we should always be willing to forgive those who have trespassed against us, so long as they have repented, repented as well. And the idea is the same with God. Another question we sometimes hear is, can I sin so much that God will not forgive me when I repent? You know, we think about that idea, you hear people say today, or hear someone give the excuse, really is what it is, is that God cannot possibly forgive me, I cannot possibly come to God because I've done so many bad and dark things. I've done so many things that they believe in their mind that are so corrupt and so vile that they can never be forgiven by God. And of course, when I think of someone giving that comment, my mind always goes to the Apostle Paul. A man who made very sure before he came to Christ, when he was known as Saul, made it as sure as possible that he had killed as many as possible the followers of Christ. That was his whole being, that, is, that was what his life was all about until he came to Christ, was to kill all those who were followers of him. But we know that, Christ, that Paul met Christ, or Saul rather, met Christ on the road to Damascus, and shortly thereafter he was visited by Ananias, who told him what he must do. What happened at that point? The Bible tells us he was baptized, and we know from Acts 2, 38, what happens at baptism when sins are washed away. Even the person who made sure he killed as many as he could before. Let's begin by looking at 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1, and let's look at verse 7. We're going to begin looking at some false ideas concerning forgiveness. Now remember, these are false ideas. I mean, they are not true. They are not accurate. In 1 John 1 and verse 7, I don't want you to notice what the Bible says in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice also Psalm 103 again. Well, this, this time, let's look at verse 10 of Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse 10 says, He has not dealt with me according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. You know what he's talking about there? That God has not put upon him there the wrath that really was due them. Notice what he says again there, verse 10. He says, He has not dealt with, me, dealt with us according to our sins. What does the book of Romans tell us when Paul's writing those in Rome concerning sin and death? The person who sins, what? Shall die. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, but so that sin shall die. Romans tells us, or Paul tells us in Romans, the law of sin is death. You sin, you die. But let's look again at verse 10. Nor punish us according to our iniquities. If someone is to die in their sins, that is, they die and have sinned in their life, they have not repented of, perhaps they have never even came to Christ, 
And thus their life is filled with sin, filled with iniquities and transgressions against God. What happens in that case? We know that God will have to punish them according to His Word. The first false idea we're to look at this evening is if I sin against God, if I sin, God will not forgive me. That's the first false idea. If I sin against God, God will not forgive me. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 18. We know that forgiveness is freely given by God. Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22 says, And Peter came, came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I my brother sin against, a, against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You know, Peter already had, at this point, an idea in his mind. Seven, that was it. That's too many times. That's, you're cut off after that. The Bible says there, Jesus said to him, I, did, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. That means what? Sit down and count how long, how many times that is? No, that means when your brother comes to you, you forgive him. We recognize that our brothers and sisters in Christ are not perfect. Because one of the first things we have against us is that we're human beings. We do things that we ought not to be doing. But as we know from the Bible, we are thankful for the grace that God forgives us, pardons our sins when we repent of those things and come to God. Satan in the world wants you to think that your sins make you too evil for God. You know, one of the hardest things to deal with many times is not just the repenting of sin, but the consequences that come thereafter. Someone who was drunk driving, hits another car, hits another person, kills them, realizes later that what they were doing, their lifestyle they're leading is wrong, comes to Christ, or immersed in baptism, has their sins washed away. Do they still deal with the consequences of their sins? Yes. It doesn't mean those things aren't remitted or those things aren't forgiven by God, but you still have to pay the price for those things while we're on this earth. In that person's case, it may have been uh, jail time or just a guilty conscience. But we know it's here in verse, verses 21 and 22. Christ wants us to understand that we are to always forgive those who come and ask for forgiveness. That doesn't mean there aren't natural consequences that come about. Somebody who steals from your house ten times, they're probably not be so keen to buy them over on the weekends. But you still forgive them for what they've done wrong, haven't you? To be like Christ, and here's our second false idea, to be like Christ wants me to be, it means I must be perfect. It means I must be perfect. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I had a sister tell me one time that, well, my husband can't, doesn't come to you, so he can't be perfect before you come to God. And I don't know how much truth was in that when she was talking about her husband. But think about that for a moment. Can anyone ever be perfect before they come to God? You don't have a chance of being perfect before you come to God. doesn't make any sense at all. A, perfect, a person who is blameless, who, who is righteous in the sight of God, is a person who has already come to Christ, had their sins forgiven, and then they already what? As perfect as possible. But that doesn't even come into play until we come to Christ to begin with. Look again there in Romans 3, verse 23. He says, For all have sinned. There's not a person in this room, there's not a person on this planet who is of an accountable age who has not sinned against God. Because we're human beings, we do things, we say things, we think things. that are sometimes contrary to God. For all have sinned and fall short. Fall short of the glory of God. We cannot be perfect human beings if we can't be as Christ-like as possible. Man cannot be perfect, but we can't be blameless. A man by the name of Job in Job chapter 1 was said to be blameless. There's a man named of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Why was Job being viewed as blameless and upright? Because he feared God and he shunned evil. He shunned the opportunity to commit sin against God. The same is also found in verse 5 when he talks about his, his sons and his daughters. So it was in the days of fasting had another course that Job would sin and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings before the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have done sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Why was 
be a blameless man. He wasn't called a perfect man, but a blameless man. Because when he sinned, he corrected it, and he prayed for those around him who could be committing sin as well. There's nothing to hold against that person. That's what it means to be blameless. Not that you're perfect, it's that you cannot hold anything against them. Man is blameless when he repents and strives to abstain from sin. This doesn't mean that he won't fall, fall over and, and over again, but he strives to be overcome his faults. You know, even Peter, after he received the miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, you know, even he too sinned. When he showed partiality, the Bible tells us Paul had to do what? He stood him to his face. Because he was free, he was staying with one group of individuals, and when someone else came, he would depart from them and go in and spend time with them. That's like us today saying, we'll spend time with all the poor folks, and when you know, the rich and wealthy come in, we're going to separate ourselves from them and go spend time with them. I mean, these guys don't even exist. He commits sin. Another false idea is the idea of asking for forgiveness publicly is a sign of weakness. John chapter 15. It should be John chapter, or James there, chapter 5. I remember I was listening to a sermon by uh, B.J. Clark. He is a frequent speaker in a lot of relationships and uh, polishing the pulpit and other things such as that. He was giving a lesson one time. And he mentioned a young lady who he grew up with. And on one occasion she had told him that she could not go forward because her parents told her that if she did it would embarrass their family. Now you know what, there's a lot of that going on, isn't there? But sometimes we don't verbalize that to our sons and daughters, but our attitude does. When we don't encourage them and pray for them and talk to them about those things afterwards or beforehand. Look at James 5 and verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, we don't have to know every dark and dirty little secret, do we? When someone comes to us and says, No, I have not been living as I should, I've been saying some things or doing some things I should not, would you please pray with me? Or pray for me? There's no shame in that at all. In fact, you find here in James that we are encouraged to do so. He says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. If we want to be stronger Christians, we must be humble Christians. We must be humble followers of God. Admit that we have done things that are contrary to God's word. God sees a humble person who asks for forgiveness and as a person who has strength and who will be exalted for, for the willingness to confess their faults. You know, the false idea is that if you go forward, that you're a weakling. That you are some evil person. You know, that's not a weakling. That's not an evil person. That's a person who's honest and humble. James chapter 4, verse 10. Here the Bible says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. You know, the opposite is true as well. If you do not humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, He will not lift you up. For what is true, so is the opposite. If, we, if one sins, it requires repentance. If it's something we've done and no one else knows about, we're going to go forward and ask those things publicly to everybody. We can go forward and ask for someone to, to pray for us, or we can pray to God for forgiveness and have those things taken care of. But if one sins publicly, that is, it sins in such a way that it becomes known and brings a black eye or reproach upon the church, that's a whole different ballgame. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, there's something we must remember there. If we confess our sins, not just, not just simple mouthing, you know, saying God I've done this, but confessing fall by what? Repentance. That's when we tell someone about the plan of salvation. That's when we say, hear, believe, repent, confess. Those things are right there together. They're not separate. They're, they go together. That we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 Timothy 5, verse 20. Those 
who are sitting rebuke in the presence of all, and the rest also may fear. There's a scary idea, isn't it? Someone who's been sitting in such a way that's bringing a reproach upon the church, making, making the whole congregation look bad. It makes us look as if we're condoning some simple actions going on. What does Paul instruct Timothy to do? He says, those who are sinning, rebuke, rebuke that is correct in the presence of all. Does he say do that because that just be hilarious? Or you see, now we can see how much pain they're in? No, he doesn't say that at all. He, what does he want to say? It's that the rest also may fear. May fear you? No, fear the judgment of God. <laughs> the reason we go to someone and encourage them and call them out and things sometimes is because if they don't, we don't do that. They'll never know they've done anything wrong and they'll die in their sins. And we don't want that to happen, do we? Sometimes we have to decide if we want to take a chance of hurting someone's feelings or not saying anything, you know they're certainly going to die and go straight to hell. You know, many times we have to take a chance to say, you know what, you're not going to like this, but we can talk. That the rest also may fear. Moving on away from the false idea, moving on to the truth. God's forgiveness means our sins do not remain. God's forgiveness means our sins do not remain. Psalm 79, verse 8, just the first part of verse 8 says, Oh, do not remember the former iniquities against us. Read about the book of Ecclesiastes, so he talks about the sins of his youth. You know, when we, we sin against God, and we recognize we have sinned against God, and realize there's no way of talking ourselves out of it, and we are convinced and con condemned that we have sinned and trespassed against the Lord, against His Word. You know, that is a very low moment, many times, for many of us. But notice also the comforting words we find from Psalm 103. For those who do humble themselves and suffer of God and repent. Psalm 103, again in our text, verses 11 and 12. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. Now notice what He says there in verse 11. So great is His mercy toward those who what? Who is He talking to? To those who fear and obey God. You know, there are a lot of people... In this life, they say, well, you know, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm a Christian. I mean, they've walked into a church at some point in their lives. And they've also walked out of it, and now they're a Christian in their eyes. Do you notice who the mercy, mercy of God is intended to? It's only extended to one group. You notice he says in verse 10, Toward those who fear Him, those who fear God, obey God, all that group is concluded there in the idea of fearing Him. Because we fear God, because we fear the chance of going to eternal damnation, or the Bible tells us that the worm dieth not, means it's never ending. We fear God, we humble ourselves, and ask God to forgive us of our sins. Then we find the words of comfort in verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, it means eternally separated, isn't it? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The key word there, removed. They're no longer there. What happens if you spill a drink in your car and you leave it there and you don't pick it up? You don't wipe those things up? You know, sometimes a long trip you don't get a chance to wipe those things up for as quick as we could. And we leave those things there and we forget about it. What happens? Does the stain magically disappear? No, it stays right there. But what happens if you go out with a paper towel or a cloth and you come out with some kind of cleaner? You spray it on you rub it and it comes right off. It's gone, isn't it? That's the same idea with God and sin. If we leave that sin there, the, the stain remains. It doesn't actually disappear over time. It hardens. It gets harder to remove. But if we humble ourselves with God, just like we go out and clean that spot off our carpet, it's removed as well. Completely and utterly removed. But we cannot leave those things there thinking they're just going to magically disappear. Because just like a stain on the carpet, it doesn't go away. It stays there until 
It is removed by us humbling ourselves before God in the ways of sin. Isaiah chapter 1. When God forgives us, our sins are fully removed. Isaiah 1, verses 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, there's a few things that are as beautiful as stepping out your front door and seeing the freshly fallen snow. Before any dogs have trampled through it, before any kids have brought in the mud and started making things and destroying them and making a big mess in your front yard. It's one of the most beautiful things you've seen. And that's how he describes it here with the idea of having our sins removed. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, pure and undefiled. They are, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What is God telling us? That when our sins are removed, you know, he doesn't say there's a little high spot left over. He doesn't say there's a little blemish there. He says what? Why as snow, they shall be as wool. They're completely gone. Again, that doesn't mean we don't have to deal with the consequences of those things. In the eyes of God, we have been forgiven when we humble ourselves before Him. <coughs> Just because our past mistakes still linger in our own minds doesn't mean God hasn't forgiven you. You know, our past errors can haunt us. This is a tool that can be used many times by Satan and those of the world. Some of our worldly friends are not careful can love to throw, up, throw your mistakes back in your face, can't they? Well, I remember when you used to do this. Even after you became a Christian, you're living a faithful life as a follower of God for many years, you come back and throw something back in your face you've done years and years ago. You know, there's one thing they forget. And when you are placed in the waters of baptism, your sins are washed away. If they're not there in the eyes of God, if those sins are not there in the eyes of God, they shouldn't be in the eyes of anyone else either. Those things are completely removed. <coughs> Satan, of course, we know has many lies and many ideas he would like for us to believe. And one of those, one of those is that God will forget our mistakes. You know, when we repent of our sins, we've seen from numerous verses, God completely removes those things. The Lord is slow to anger, in abounding in mercy. Psalm 103 and verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always stop with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. If you think about those phrases there, those are huge for us to remember. Now, of course, we understand that it's not a license for us to commit sin and believe that God's just going to wipe those things away and not us do anything different. These verses only apply to those, as we saw earlier, who fear God. Those who fear God and obedient to Him, we see here that the Lord is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. You know, if the Lord was not any of these things here, we would be without any hope whatsoever. We'd be the most pitiful people in the world because there'd be nothing we do about our sins. <coughs> God is willing to forgive those who are who God's willing to forgive, we must be willing to repent. Psalm 103, verse 13, the Bible says, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. When we make mistakes, we know that God can, will forgive us if we will humble ourselves before him. We also know here, as we see in verse 13, the father pities his children. Or pities those who fear. I mean, he recognizes we are not, you might say, the brightest bulbs in the box, or because we do things sometimes that make no sense whatsoever. You know, David and Bathsheba, that made no sense whatsoever. What the things he done, the things he did. 
Especially after all the ways God had blessed him. What he did, it made no sense at all. But God still forgave him. And God still made him deal with consequences as well. The question isn't if God will forgive. The question is, are you willing to repent and strive to be the Christian that you ought to be? You know, God's forgiveness is not in question for those who are willing to humble themselves before God. That's never in question. The problem comes, the question comes upon our comes upon us. Are we willing to change? 1 John 1 verse 7 says, But we walk in the light as he is in the light. And there is the question. If we walk in the light. And if we don't desire to walk in the light of God, if we don't desire to be changed people in the eyes of God, we can forget all about forgiveness. Those who come to God immersed in, bapt in baptism, have their sins washed away at that time, and then go off their own merry way and never do what God commands us to do, to continue to grow and learn, to encourage others, to reach out to those as we have opportunity to, to help come to Christ, to help in other ways. We leave all those bare basic things of the Christian behind and never touch any of those things? Is that somebody's walking in the light? He says, we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship. <coughs> we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Does God have the ability to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west? There is no doubt. The question we must decide, the question we must address in our own lives every day is, are we willing to allow Him to do so? You know, Christ died on the cross for all mankind. That only works if we are obedient to Him. Just because Christ died on the cross for us doesn't mean love and actually give the benefits of His death, does it? It all means we must obey Him follow his, his command concerning salvation, and then we receive the forgiveness of our sins. Then we receive the chance to have eternal life. But only if we obey. Everything hinges upon, hinges upon our own obedience. We have so many things that God offers us, but if we disobey, we can forget about every one of them. You know, Paul tells those in Ephesus that what we have are given uh, every spiritual blessings from God to those who are in Christ. I mean, only those who are in Christ have spiritual blessings. Those spiritual blessings include salvation, forgiveness of our sins, fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. The list goes on and on and on. If we are not obedient, then we can forget about all of it. This evening I've heard just a portion of what the Bible has to say about forgiveness and have our sins completely and utterly removed from our lives. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you repent of your sins, that is, to, to recognize you have been living a way that's contrary to God, make a determination in your own mind, you're going to follow God from now on. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Be immersed in baptism, Acts 2, verse 38, so our sins can be washed away. And then we are also placed in the body of Christ, Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. And then what must we do? Remain faithful. Revelation 2, verse 10. We're faithful to death. I'll give you the crown of life. But also give us the forgiveness of sins throughout our, throughout our lives as we live out on this earth. So long as we're willing to repent of those sins and always be obedient to God. This evening, if you have any need, concerns, you come forward now. That's going to be standing to encourage you.